Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. We'll talk to Cindy McCain about human trafficking and what is being done to stop it. Also, the importance of Hispanic businesses to be environmentally conscious. All this coming up next on 40 Something. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you for joining us. Earlier this year, Governor Jan Brewer assembled a task force to address human trafficking. Last month, they issued a final report to the governor. Some of the recommendations included toughening penalties against Johns and raising awareness of the issue. With me tonight to talk about human trafficking is Cindy McCain with the McCain Institute for International Leadership. Mrs. McCain is also one of the co-chairs for the Governor's Task Force on Human Trafficking. Mrs. McCain, welcome to Horizonte. Thank you. Um, before we get into the details of the report, give us a sense of the scope of the problem. It's enormous, and it's, it's the lives of our children that are at stake here. I, it, most people, if you talk to people that really don't know what human trafficking is all about, they assume it's in Cambodia, it's in South America, it's in Eastern Europe, but it's not here. On, it, it, not only in our borders, but in our own state. And not only is it here, but it's huge and it's deadly. And when you say it's here, it, it's in surprising places. You and yes. I talked a little bit off camera. You mentioned Mesa being mm -hmm. a, a place where they, they've mm -hmm. run into some problems. Mesa is, a, there's a, the, within Mesa there's a lot of uh, businesses, massage parlors, things like this that are, that are there and uh, there have been women that have brought in specifically for that that are being held against their will. Uh, they're being, and these are not women that are of age, these are young girls that have been either brought in from overseas or domestically. Uh, I, I, I mentioned, I mentioned the, the domestic portion because it is a huge issue within the borders of the United States where upwards 25, 30 million kids are being moved around for just this purpose. It's tragic. And, 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 and not to pick on Mesa, I mentioned no, it simply because that's no. one of the last places you'd expect this to be, exactly. but it's a statewide problem. It is. And that's why the governor uh, appointed the task force. Mm -hmm. Tell us how the task force came to be and, and its composition. Well, uh, I approached the governor and told her of a need that I thought was very important and uh, that I, I really would, would like to, to do something about this and would she help me. And the next thing I knew, I was put in co-chair of a task force that she announced at the State of the State this past year, and the rest is history. We have, have we compiled a group of people that are by far the best in this state for just this purpose. We had a, a, a few attorneys, as we should have had on there. We had we had a former attorney general. Uh, we had some folks that are NGO workers that work just in this arena. They had me. Uh, we had, our, my co-chair was Gil Rontia, the head of Arizona Homeland Security. It was a broad spectrum of people with a lot of background uh, that we could bring to the table. And I think a lot of people would assume that to the extent it's a problem in Arizona, it's because we're a border state, but that's not the only reason. Yeah. No, it's not the only reason. Uh, we're a, we are, are a state that has a lot of conventions. More now, we're beginning to get our convention business back. Uh, we're hosting the Super Bowl in 2015. Uh, Barrett Jackson car shows, uh, you know, we've had had in the past all-star games. Uh, we're a busy state and with that comes the bad side and that is human trafficking. And you have mentioned in a number of, of press reports the importance of getting our house in order, so to speak, before the Super Bowl. Yeah. Not simply because of, of all the uh, good stuff that's going to happen because it attracts these kinds of, yeah. of people in this kind of business. Yeah, we have to be proactive in this and unfortunately we didn't have any legislati legislation on the books that was really proactive and very and and making these these pimps and these bad guys know uh, that Arizona is going to be a flyover state if you intend to do this in our border you're going to jail for a long time. And, and you told me that it's not just bad guys, we also have women who are pimps. Yeah, it's men and women uh, uh, t taking small groups, big groups of, of children, not just little girls, but little boys as well, around the country. These, they move in, in, you can watch them move almost with the weather as well as with, with events and things that are going on. And it's the ability also for us to be able to educate and train our law enforcement on this issue, train our airline on this issue. We have, a whole, we have an airline based in this state and, and we're looking forward to being able to assist them uh, in their, their employee training. Uh, the hospitality industry, hotels, motels, 
bars, restaurants. Uh, this is going to be a broad sweeping effort, uh, uh, not just, the, it doesn't stop with just legislation, then it then comes the real work after that. And some of the things you're talking about are, are going to be the base, are based upon recommendations in the report. Let's talk about the report now mm -hmm. more specifically. Mm -hmm. Tell us, give us a kind of an overview of, of the proposals. Well, the proposals are broad sweeping, which is what we wanted, and we believe the governor is going to to take our recommendations and hopefully utilize them in, in whatever she drafts in all of this. Uh, we, we couldn't stop at just penalties or at, uh, it, it was how things are, it was, how, for instance, how children are, are handled once they come into the system. Do we arrest them? Do we treat them as victims? Well, it's really both because we need to protect them. So there's a part of that that offers the opportunity for us to be able to arrest these kids, but, kids, but then once they're determined that they're victims, then expunge their record for that. But it's also the services that go with this. How do we provide services for these kids once they're in the system? And a lot of them are, are already former members of the system and the system failed them. Yeah, I think, I think the report mentions that a lot of them are foster children yeah, or have been of, through that system. A lot of them foster children, a lot of them just plain runaways. I mean, it's just, it's every, in every kid that, that comes, comes from a broken home, a disrupted home, whatever it may be, and, and unfortunately they wind up in this. A lot of proposals in the report for legislation. Mm -hmm. Um, there was an attempt last year mm -hmm. to get some legislation out of our legislature. Mm -hmm. It failed. You were critical mm -hmm. of that failure. Mm -hmm. What's going to be different this time? Well, I think what's different this time is that we have a different kind of legislative piece. We have, uh, like I said, it's broad sweeping. It's going to encompass a lot of different areas with this. I mean, we have to think about whether or not we want to, to confiscate uh, materials that are owned by these by these guys, you know, there, there's all kinds of things that come, that come into play with this. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm relying on my lawyer friends to, to figure out what's right and of course the governor's people to figure out what's right. What we want are stiff penalties for these guys. These guys need to know that they cannot do this here, not in Arizona. Uh, but it also means, you know, once we go down hard on this kind of stuff, again, like I said, we need uh, the ability to be able to help these kids once, they're, once we've got them, you know, and they're safe with us. The piece of legislation I was referring to from last year mm -hmm. would have lowered the age for certain purposes, the age of victims that, that would right. enhance the penalties. What I, what I was, was critical of in that piece was the fact that it wasn't even allowed to be heard. And, uh, you know, we, we, I have met since then with the, the chairman of judiciary, and he and I have agreed to, to disagree on that issue. Uh, but I have his assurance that we are going to, to offer a piece of legislation. I have his assurance that he is supportive of this. And I, so I'm looking forward to working with him. I really am. One of the points that the report makes is, is the need for public awareness. Right. How so? Oh my gosh! Well, like I said, like I said earlier on, uh, people think it's it's somewhat someplace else. That's overseas. That happens, you know, in in weird countries that don't monitor themselves. It doesn't. It happens right here, right in their own neighborhoods. And so we need to make our public within Arizona aware that this is going on. It's going on right here in our state. And this is how you can help. This is what you can do as a private citizen to be able to help empower our law enforcement, our first responders, our, our city councils, our mayors, uh, our governor in, in all of this. And um, uh, you talk about the public helping. Uh, speaking of help, there will be a lot of other organizations, mm -hmm. um, some you're already working with, some that will be here in connection mm -hmm. with the Super Bowl, one of them uh, support hope. Uh, shared hope. Shared yes, hope. Shared Hope. They're a, they're a wonderful organization. Uh, Shared Hope uh, does a lot of awareness training. They do training of first responders uh, around the country. In fact, they are hosting a group of Arizonans uh, in Washington, D.C. I think it's the first week in November for just that purpose. Uh, there's some state legislators going. Uh, our job uh, is to, to, once we get everyone trained immediately, then branch out. The trainers are going to train people. The trainers are going to train other trainers. Uh, we need a billboard campaign, which we've already nailed down. Uh, it's just, it's, it's so many things uh, that for us to be able to make this work, we have got to come down hard on everyone and be, and be, have a visible presence in all this. And I don't, by that, I don't mean vigilante presence. I mean the kind of presence that is a knowledgeable, knowledgeable presence with the owners of establishments and, and 
uh, businesses around town realizing that there's a problem and being aware of it and being able to report it. You also talk about training of, of first responders mm -hmm. of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. What is it that they need to know that they don't know right now? Oh gosh, you know, God love these guys. They're and men and women. They're they're so good at what they do. But a lot of times, they've not. You know, it's all about looking looking at things through different eyes. And and when you see uh, a woman and three little girls, is that what it should be? You know, in a in a mall, for instance, or uh, just being aware of all the things that could be a, a possibility. And what does the child look scared? Uh, does the child look disheveled or beaten or hungry. Uh, there's a lot of different things that come into play in this and it's about training our, our people with, with their eyes. Now just recently you met with the wife of President Fox mm -hmm. of Mexico. Yeah. You talked about this. Mm -hmm. Tell us about those discussions. Well it's important that uh, I believe that uh, in, my, in my humble opinion I think women are very good at this and very good at, at being not only activists but getting it done. And so she and I have committed from both our countries uh, to work together uh, on the border to stop human trafficking coming across the borders. These are the same guys that are drug runners that are doing it, that are, that are moving laborers across the border. Uh, and so, so she and I have committed to work together in not only an awareness campaign, but in an effort to really stop it, working with both of our border patrols. And Mrs. McCain, as you've just indicated, you're not done with this yet. Yeah. I mean, you, you, your oh, only task force <laughs> prepared the report, yeah. but you yourself intend to continue to be involved. How so? Yeah. Well, we have a western corridor of states that are, could be stronger in this issue. And so I believe that if we get our own house in order in Arizona, that we need to take the McCain Institute, along with ASU, needs to take this up through the central corridor, encouraging these states by not only our example, but our legislation that we've enacted, uh, encouraging them to do the same thing and, re and make, help, helping them understand and realize why we need to do this and work together as the Western states. So you're going to be very busy over I'm the next busy, few months? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and part of that is fundraising, so I yeah. assume you'll be working with the business community as well? I will, I will. And that's particularly for the, uh, the build up to the Super Bowl and, the, and in the weeks that are during the Super Bowl, so, you know, activities that are going on here in Arizona. Cindy McCain, thank you for joining us thank on Odyssey to talk me. about this in very, I very want to talk some more topic. about it. I hope I can come back. We will have you back, I guarantee it. Thank you. Thank you. The things I like on Horizonte are the legal stuff more than anything else because I'm familiar with that. And Jose is such a good interview about legal. It's very hard to interview people about legal topics. They're very complicated. And he has a way of bringing people out and getting, getting the message out in a completely neutral way. So those are my favorite segments. Why do people watch Horizonte? I think in order to learn about what's going on in Arizona in the Hispanic community or that affects the Hispanic community that they can't learn anyplace else. To find out more information about what's on Horizonte, go to azpbs.org and click on the Horizonte tab at the top of the screen. There you can access many features to become a more informed Horizonte viewer. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button or by scrolling down to the bottom of the page for the most recent segments. Learn about more specific topics like arts and culture and immigration. You can also find out what's on Horizonte for the upcoming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or you want to buy a video, that's all on our website, too. Other features include our collection of website links and a special page for educators. While you're there, show your support for Horizonte with just one click. Discover all that's on Horizonte. Visit azpbs.org, Horizonte, today. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the Aid Insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. The Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and the Green Chamber for Greater Phoenix are teaming up to challenge the myth that Hispanics are not environmentally conscious. Here to talk about this with me is Natalia Ronceria Ceballos. Director of Member Services for the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and Michael Grossman, Chairman for the Greater Chamber for Greater Phoenix, the Green Chamber, rather, for Greater Phoenix. Thank you both for joining us on mm -hmm. Horizonte. Um, are, just a few words about the, the Green Chamber, how it came to be, and, and what its focus is. 
Sure, we, we had the wisdom, uh, our founder had the wisdom to start the organization just as Lehman Brothers in the financial world was crashing. Uh, made for an interesting beginning. Uh, we are actually celebrating our fifth anniversary this month. Our mission is to advance a sustainable economy. We do that through uh, networking uh, with others. We do that through promoting green businesses. We do that through discovering new green businesses. And we, just do, we also advocate for green businesses. Uh, we collectively uh, try to build a community both to teach people how to operate more sustainably as well as to cheerlead those who are already uh, creating the businesses, the green businesses of the future. And sustainability is the key. Uh, uh, when we spoke a little bit off camera, you, you, you pointed out it's not just being environmentally conscious, it's sustainability. Sure. Those, those two things, well, well, analogous, aren't exactly the same thing. Um, when we talk about sustainability, it, it can mean many different things, including the culture of re reuse, which we'll be talking about a little bit more. That happens to be also good for the planet, but they mean slightly different things. Now, Natalia, you were concerned about this issue even before you joined the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Give us some sense of your background. Absolutely. Well, my background is not in sustainability initiatives or issues, though that said, I saw just as a citizen of our state and of our nation that this is a topic that is not just a trend. This is something that really is relevant and important for all businesses to have on the table and be discussing. That led me to get involved with the Green Chamber and in a way to educate myself, but also to show that this isn't just a niche group. This isn't just you have to be a sustainability professional or that is your track to have this as a consideration, that this is actually something that everyone be considering. And, and everyone includes the members that you're responsible for as, as a uh, yeah, director yes. of membership <laughs> services. Um, what kind of reaction, I know you, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the networking event that's coming up, but, but to date, what kind of reaction have you gotten from members of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce to, to the notion that they need to be environmentally conscious or sustainability conscious? Well, we haven't done any sort of blanket survey or anything that I can directly say this is what our member base is responding to. But that said, everybody that I've been able to dialogue with to date and that we've had discussions with have been very open to it and have actually said, well, now's the time, that this is exactly the right time to be collaborating and to actually be exposing our member base more to the concepts of sustainability and how that affects business. Now, we talked uh, in the intro about the myth Mm -hmm. uh, that, that uh, uh, Hispanic-owned businesses maybe aren't as, as concerned about these issues. Even before, though, the two of you kind of put your heads together to talk about this relationship between the two chambers, there was some research that went a long way mm -hmm. toward dispelling this myth. Tell us about that. Absolutely. Well, yeah, just as we had spoken about earlier, it is very interesting that there is this perceived myth that Hispanics, Latinos, that the population are not invested or concerned with issues around sustainability or even conservation. But in fact, the statistics show a very opposite story to be true. And uh, Simmons did this study back in 2011, so now it's already a couple of years old, and it shows that Latinos, even Spanish dominant households, over-index. They actually are at 52 percent, they over-index where they say that having others perceive them as being environmentally conscious is something that is important to them. They over-index on choosing products that are advertised as being more sustainable or green, if you want to call it that. So it's actually something that the culture we believe at the Hispanic Chamber, we're seeing that the overarching Hispanic culture is actually predisposed to sustainability and conservation, even if it's not something that has been defined in that way in the past. It's been just part of the culture. But now that we're picking it out, we're saying like, no, actually these, these are issues that we are aware well, of. And, and, and Michael, when Natalia talks about over-indexing, it's as against the population at large and even as against um, uh, English-speaking, dominant-speaking um, Hispanic households. Does that come as a surprise to you? Um, it, it shouldn't because uh, there but is, I, I think it does to most people. It, it, I mean, does, we, to we most, it, it does to most people, but if, if you think about it, in, in Latino culture, which is intertwined with the Catholic Church, one of the tenets of 
uh, biblical teachings is stewardship. So the fact that there is, um, that, that the, the numbers came out the way they did, probably shouldn't be surprising, but there is a perception that sustainability is something only for uh, overeducated, rich Anglos. Uh, and and that's, that's been a problem that we've been trying to overcome, not just our organization, but uh, anybody who's, who is working, whether it be in renewable, anything from renewable energy to just operating more sustainably, uh, has the misperception that this means that green or sustainability is more expensive and it's, and it's an elitist uh, philosophy. Yeah, in part because of the, uh, the perceived cost right. of sustainability. So, so you have countries around the world who say, well, it's easy for you, the United States, to say this, given where you're at now. But when you were where we were at, you were doing the same thing in terms of coal mining and everything else. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think people just assume that, that with Hispanic-owned businesses, uh, and if they're Spanish-dominant, people assume that they're recent immigrants and that they might have that same attitude that th this may be all well and good, but I gotta make money. And that's very true. Where we are, our jobs, I would say, what we are tasked with right now is to help the community understand though that while there are these very large initiatives that a business or even a home can take, let's say, to become more sustainable, that actions funnel down to the small details in life and that's why we have this theme this month the the chambers the the theme of our event this culture of reuse why because even in the poorest of nations what do what are we accustomed to we reuse our bottles we reuse the packaging that we get something and all of that is actually a form of recycling it's reusing objects and it's actually one of the highest forms not I would say Michael of, of recycling if you look at the the world right now so I, again I think there's a lot so we have something to learn from the rest of the absolutely, world absolutely yeah. absolutely well also in how we define sustainability and and that it isn't exactly what Michael's saying it isn't something that you need a huge pocketbook to to buy into that this is something at all levels Let, let's talk about the event itself Michael what's coming up um, we are celebrating as part of our fifth anniversary, one of our uh, first events of the year is going to be uh, an outreach event in collaboration with the Hispanic Chamber for our November green drinks on November 5th uh, at the Fire Sky Resort in Scottsdale. And it's a chance for these two great organizations, one that has a, a rich history in, in the Valley and one that is a bit of an upstart, if you don't mind me saying so, uh, to, to get together and talk about these kind of issues that, that actually bring us together. Mm -hmm. And what will be the format of the event? I mean, usually uh, these are considered mixers and, and people exchange business cards and have a few drinks, but, but this is gonna have an educational component. We do, because we are able to, to bring uh, to bear so many folks who are so richly steeped in, in sustainability, we're able to bring both speakers as well as folks who, uh, who write articulately on the topic and we are able not just to share, share thoughts on, on that particular evening, but throughout the entire month is, is devoted to this culture of sustainability uh, uh, theme. Mm -hmm. Natalia, how, how can people get involved? How, what are you doing to promote the event? Well, an array, actually, of sites. You can go on either organization's website to get more information, and also to register as well. Uh, for members of either organization it is a free event otherwise it's only ten dollars for non-members to come and join and see what both organizations are about if if you're curious and finding out more facebook of course we use all of the social media avenues uh, that others use um, please reach out to us i would say reach out to the green chamber reach out to the hispanic chamber if you're a member of either and want to know more about the counterpart and how it can benefit your business, we're here to help answer those questions. If you have never heard about either chamber and want to learn more, this is a perfect opportunity to come in and have that happen. I think this is just the beginning of a, of a really worthwhile relationship and hopefully you'll see a lot more collaboration in the future. Now, Michael, Natalia says just the beginning. Where, where do you go from here? Well, it, I, I, to, to use the words of Humphrey Bogart, it's the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Um, nothing, huh? Uh, no, but, I get it, but <laughs> remember how the movie ends, they split up. So, no, that's not right, they stay together. They stay together. Yeah. So, I've got to watch the movies more often. <laughs> um, 
Look, it, it's it's our hope to uh, to encourage members who are our members to uh, to join the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce as well as vice versa. One of the nice things about both of these organizations is they don't simply represent a specific geographic area, but rather are valley wide. So we have members from from the East Valley to the West Valley, as does the Hispanic Chamber. So there's an opportunity there that doesn't exist with a lot of chambers. And we're going to have to end on that note. It does sound like a beautiful beginning, and, and I'll get my movie metaphors right next time. <laughs> thank you for joining us <laughs> on thank Horizonte. Thank you. That's our show for tonight from all of us here at Horizonte. I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good evening. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.